Let's take our Bibles and look again to the book of Proverbs, this book of wisdom that is all about Christ, our wisdom, and just the wisdom that the Lord gave to Solomon to write these Proverbs, and what's here in this word that's been preserved is only a portion of many, many other Proverbs that he wrote, some say over 3,000, some that were written. But we know if it's here, preserved for us, it's the Spirit of God himself that gave him this wisdom to write these Proverbs. And because this is a spiritual book, it means that these cannot be approached with natural wisdom. In fact, our Lord when asked why it was he spoke in Proverbs, he said very plainly that those that are without might not see, seeing they might not see, hearing they might not hear. It's purpose to draw a line. And we know that because before the Lord taught us that all of scripture has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the wisdom and power of God, if you're like me, I read these Proverbs and I tried to get some practical application out of it and certainly did for everyday living, but in so doing, missed Christ. And so as we're going through and studying these Proverbs, we pray that the Spirit of God grant us eyes to see Christ and how these things pertain to Christ when one old preacher was asked, well, what is the right interpretation of Scripture? He said, anything that abases man and exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. You can never go wrong. So what we're going to look at today here in Proverbs 14, I've, and, and in natural wisdom, you read this and you think, well, these are just a series of different Proverbs. But there's one connection, and that is Christ. And I would encourage all of us that as we study and read the scriptures, start with Christ, continue with Christ, and end with Christ, and forget the rest. Because that is how the Lord directs his word. So I've entitled this, verses 24 to 27, which is our text, the children's place of refuge. So when you think of the children, whose children? Well, those are the children of God. Christ said that wisdom is justified by her children. In other words, manifest in how God is just to justify sinners. But the place of refuge, and this is taken right out of verse 26, which is in the middle. When I sit down and begin to read a portion of scripture, I look for one thought pertaining to Christ on which all of the verses hang. Like most of us have a little place by our door when we walk in where you hang things so you can always remember where they are. And here in verse 26, which is right in the middle between 24 and 27, is that on which all of these scriptures hang. It says, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence and his children shall have a place of refuge. Now just that one portion of scripture there opens up an entire message about Christ who is that refuge. When you think about what a refuge is, there's different terms we use today. There's a wildlife refuge that we have over here in uh, Shreveport. A lot of people don't know about it, but there it is. And you can go back there and walk around. I've never done it yet, but there are all kinds of different species of birds and animals, reptiles, whatnot, that they're protected. There's no hunter that is going to be go, going in there and having a heyday shooting these animals. They're protected. That's why it's called a sanctuary in the sense of a refuge. And you think about who Christ is as our refuge. That in and of itself, where nothing can harm you, nothing can get in, no, no fowler can come in and snare you. Now there's plenty out there that were it not for 
Christ the refuge, we would certainly be the prey of these predators that would have us. You think about a shelter. You know, storm comes through and you hear, seek shelter. Find that safe haven. That's what a refuge is. Protection, a harbor, an asylum. Different synonyms that you can use. And just to read here that his children, whose children? The Lord's children shall have a place of refuge. In other words, shall always have. Now, in the Old Testament, before Christ came and paid the debt, that refuge was in the forbearance of God. God has chosen those that he's purposed to save and from eternity put them in Christ. So he is that refuge. And there in, even before he came to lay down his life to pay the sin debt, under God's forbearance, God was forbearing with their sin until such time as Christ came and fulfilled all of God's law and justice and that righteousness imputed to their account. That righteousness can never be taken away. I hear some say it would be great if we could just all go back to that state before the fall. No, don't want to go there because that was fallible. We need a righteousness that can never be taken away. And that is the righteousness of God. You can't have a safer refuge than that. So let's read these scriptures here from verse 24 down to 27 in Proverbs 14. We'll have a word of prayer and then see how we can tie this particular theme, if you will, a place of refuge in with all of the verses that precede and come after, because everything is in a context. So in verse 24, we read, The crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. A true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, as we take up your word, I pray that your spirit would be our teacher. I'm nothing but a spokesman that can only speak and only declare the glories of Christ as you give utterance. So I pray that your spirit would speak through me, through the preparation done and reading and studying this portion, but that your spirit would so direct that your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, be glorified and that those that are yours, the children here mentioned might Find in him a true refuge, a shelter in the storm. And I pray that our hearts would be comforted through your word. We give you the praise and honor and glory, our dear Savior's name. Amen. So verse 24, I've entitled simply a refuge in the infinite riches of our wise one. When it says here, the crown of the wise is their riches. Well, we know that there's only one wise one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the very wisdom and power of God. And you notice one crown. To him be all the glory and honor. That crown of him as being the king. And if we had anything to say about Christ in comparison to so-called wise ones in this world who rule and reign, the biggest difference is that as of men, it's temporary. It's only but for a season, and then it's gone. Rich men, so-called wise men, according to the world, their wisdom dies with them. There's nothing infinite there, but here, when we think of the crown of the wise one being his riches. 
I think of Boaz with regard to Ruth. There was another kinsman redeemer that was legally in line, but when he heard of what it would take to redeem Naomi, and it, through Naomi, Ruth, he said, I cannot. Even with all that he had, he could not. When you read there, and if you haven't read the book of Ruth in a while, I would encourage you to do so. When you read about Boaz being from Bethlehem, and it says was a wealthy man. <laughs> I'll tell you, that's who we need when it comes to one being our representative and one being our federal head, one that to be our husband, one to be our crown. We want one whose riches are infinite. And so when it says here, the crown of the wise is their riches. In other words, that this is what separates them out. This is what identifies them above and in contrast to verse 24, the foolishness of fools, which is folly. You stop and think, for example, go over to Ephesians chapter 1. We're not talking about earthly riches here. If you listen this morning to the radio broadcast, you'll see a connection between what I'm talking about here and what I preached on, true riches. And so as we live out in this world, I know many times we get caught up with the physical and material things of our lives, worried about how, the, how we're going to pay the bills, how we're going to retire, and this and that, which is just temporary, but yet it so fills our time in pursuits and thinking. And if this is of any help to you, as it is to me, to think that, thank God it is temporary, that there's going to be a day when this will no longer be an issue. But oh, to have the true riches, which are for eternity. I don't know if you could take 70 years of life and 80 and put it somewhere on a, a line where when you project it out throughout eternity, which is infinite, <laughs> That, that little speck of time that seems like a long time, but really isn't, even if you live to be 100, it's all going away. What is truly of importance to any one of us if we're the Lord's? Well, it's this one who, by his riches, see, he being God from eternity and being charged as the wise one, because you talk about wisdom. This had to be worked out by a man in the flesh on behalf of sinners that God has chosen. But there's our hope because Isaiah 53 says, By his knowledge shall my righteous one justify many, my righteous servant. He was wisdom in the flesh, and behind him all of the riches of grace and mercy and pardon and justification, all of those riches, not just for a time, but for eternity in him. Oh, what a glorious truth, and to think that he is our refuge. Here in Ephesians 1, this is what Paul, by the Spirit, exclaimed, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of Naomi, what she said when she found out it was Boaz who was that kinsman redeemer. Bless God, because she had nothing. Came back, went out full, came back empty. Brought with her a Moabite, who by the law should have been condemned, and yet in God's purpose, there was enough in Boaz, that wealthy one, for her and all of her lineage all the way down to Christ. You think about how God purposed that, that Boaz was the grandfather of, of David. Through David, that seed of Christ would come. Who would have thought? And so blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, notice here, with all spiritual blessings. We could be the poorest of the poor in the world. And yet in this one wise one, are riches, the riches, spiritual 
blessings, it says here, in heavenly places, but don't ever stop there, in Christ, in Christ. According as he has, you say, what are those riches? Here it is. Electing grace, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Here's another one of those riches that we should be holy and without blame before him. And then again, in love having predestinated us under the adoption of children. Well, you can't, it just continues to flow how God has purposed it through his wise one, his righteous servant, such as we should be blessed even to be called children of God by adoption. People today think in terms of someone being adopted from a poor family into a rich one. And you'll hear people say, well, you got lucky. Luck has nothing to do with it. God purposed that. He could have left you where you were, but by adoption now has brought you into a better situation. But I'll tell you, any kind of, physical or material circumstances pale in comparison to these true riches of God in Christ. You might have been adopted from one poor family into another one, and you think, well, my material state isn't any better than it was. But when you talk about being adopted from what we were in our deadness and sins and, and brought into the family of God, in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't have any greater riches than that. It says here, having predestinated, that even that is a, though the world cavils at it, but that's a riches. The fact that, who am I that God should foreordain that such a wretch as I should be one of his children? And notice here, it's not according to the good pleasure of our will. We have nothing to do with it. It's according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So as we study here the children's place of refuge, it's founded upon God's will and purpose and how he has purposed. It's not everybody that has Christ as this refuge. It's not everybody that has Christ as their wisdom. It's not everybody that has Christ as their infinite riches. All that he is is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't help but think about Mephibosheth, who was of the, the household of Saul, the enemy of David. And yet the scriptures say, David, for Jonathan's sake, fetched him and brought him to his table. He was lame from a fall. He was, there was nothing in Mephibosheth that was any goodness or service to David himself. He had nothing. But he had everything when David put him at his table. Sat him there among the other sons of David. And not one difference made. If anybody walked by and thought, well, what's Mephibosheth doing sitting at the king's table? The king loved him and sought him and brought him. And the same thing can be said of any of us. Who am I that I should even be a part of this wise one and his riches of glory? But... All the glory belongs unto God himself. And you can see the contrast there in verse 24. It's in contrast to the foolishness of fools and folly. <laughs> you sum man up outside of Christ, outside, I don't care how elevated he may be in the eyes of other people in the world and some love to glorify him and think about him. But in the end, they're nothing but fools in their folly and foolishness. Three times it's mentioned there. That's all you can say about any that are outside of Christ. They're foolish. You say, how are they foolish? They have no thoughts of Christ. They're proud of their own works, their own striving, their own doing. And they're fools in the sense here of they have no knowledge or will even to think of a need of someone else. That's why the Pharisees were condemned. They thought that they had all they needed just in their tradition, being the seed of Abraham. And our Lord warned them, said, you say you have Abraham as your father. If you had him as your father, then you would believe me, just like Moses. 
But they, and this is where sin puts everything on its head, they saw him as being the foolish one. For even so speaking, and yet they were the fools in their folly. They died as they had lived. But thank God, when you get over to 1 Corinthians, look with me in 1 Corinthians, such were some of you. So don't think that we were born in this wisdom. We had to be taught by the Spirit of God, who is our wisdom. But that's what the Spirit of God does. It's 1 Corinthians 1. See in verse 26, on 25, it says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, if God had foolishness. It's just a manner of speaking. The weakness of God is stronger than men. And this is on the heels of what he said in verse 24, unto them which are called, that's the summons by the Spirit, both Jews and Greeks. See, the Jews thought themselves above others. But here they're all put on the same level, Jew or Greek. If any is the Lord's, it's due to Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. There's no room for any glory here regarding any man, no matter what your social status is in life. Because it says in verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Think about how many are considered to be somewhat before men, and yet they're in this category over here in verse 24 of Proverbs 14 of the foolish. And this is what the Lord, when he's pleased to draw any one of his own, which is what that word called means, to summons, not let you stay in that state that you are. It's then that the Lord shows you that had he left you there, you would have lived and died in your foolishness. But here in verse 27, it says, God hath chosen. But here again, it comes back to the foundation being God himself. You can't take any glory for this. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And look at the descending order that we have here. Starts with the foolish things. And then God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And then it goes even lower, verse 28, the base things of the world. And then even lower, the things which are despised. Even as they despise our Lord Jesus Christ. So this world in its folly despises any children of God that he's chosen that Christ has redeemed. But oh, to be of that despised number that God has chosen, yea, and things which are not. You think about in the beginning, the creation of the world, everything was created out of nothing. The same thing is true spiritually. God spoke, God purposed, God acted, God worked to take such a wretched sinner as I am and bring me into this refuge, this safe haven. It's not according to any riches of my own, but according to the eternal riches of God in Christ Jesus. I have nothing. That's why Christ said, blessed are the poor. We bring nothing. There's that hymn that is in our hymn book. We never sing it because it's as false as you could ever imagine. But it asks the question, must I go an empty handed? As if to, you don't want to present yourself before the Lord without anything. There's nothing worse than to think that I've got to come with something. I have nothing. I've got to be brought. I have to be drawn. And I have to be given in God's grace. Everything that comes out of that great storehouse of God's wisdom in Christ. All the riches are in him. And so it says, these are chosen. Yea, the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. In other words, the true riches of God in Christ, that's everything, and brings to naught anything else that we thought we had. That no flesh, here's the reason, no flesh glory in his presence. There's a lot of flesh glory going on in works religion. 
And people tend to try to sugarcoat it with the word grace. I know it's by grace, but I, you can take poison and sugarcoat it and swallow it. It tastes pretty good going down. It's still poison. And that's what that message of works or man's will as any having any importance or significance in what it is to be a child of God. Here it says in verse 30, again, here's the infinite riches of our wise one, how he came and worked out God's law and justice to the satisfaction of a holy God. Of him, that is of God, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. See, we got nothing, so we need him to be made unto us, such as the wisdom of the wise one and his riches. So infinite is that grace. There is no sin that is ever too strong, even though we may feel it and wonder, well, how could God ever be merciful to me? The sin, that's what mercy is. That's what the grace of God is. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Summed up in this one representative substitute, made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Can you add anything to that? Everything with regard to our salvation is summed up in him. And again, the reason given, verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You know, any... Buddy, that in any way gives glory in even a small way to their works or to their will or to their walk, they are fools and they are exposing their foolishness and darkness. Now, they may be the Lord's and it may be that the, he will yet bring them to see the glories of this wise one and his riches infinite riches of God in Christ. But while they remain with that thought, thinking somehow they had something to contribute to their salvation, they're fools. So that's the first point, a refuge here, and it's a refuge in the infinite riches of our wise one, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a refuge it is. You can lay down and go to sleep with this. It's rest knowing that he has fulfilled it. He has accomplished it. And there's nothing that could ever take that away. Now, the second point here in Proverbs 14, 25, it speaks of a true witness that delivers souls. And I can remember back in the day having soul winning classes. Let's go out and win souls for Jesus. And I say it to my shame, but I sat there on the front row with the, with the worst of them. Want to learn, well, how, how is it we deliver souls among the Jews, when you witness to the Jews? How do we win souls when it comes to witnessing to the Jehovah's Witnesses? Or how we had a all, I took a, an entire class on the cults one time, what they call the cults, and how it is each one that you addressed, you had to have a certain script, it's like seven, that you used to try to win them over. And wherever we saw that word soul winner in scripture, we thought, okay, that's us. That's where you get the buzzer. <clears throat> Wrong. Wrong every time. Here when it says, a true witness delivereth souls. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is that true witness. And the last part is everybody else that thinks there's someone out there supposedly winning souls. They're deceitful witnesses that speak lies. Now you get people upset because someone can be zealous, just like Paul spoke of the Jewish brethren. He said, I acknowledge that they have a zeal for God, but he said, not according to knowledge. And whenever I hear anybody saying, well, God loves you and just says it, he's lying on God. That's a deceitful witness. Can you imagine if on the outside of the ark, there had been a great big neon flashing sign that said God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Now there is a God that saves whom he will and he saves those that he loves. There's a God that condemns whom he will, such as the God of the Bible. 
So whenever you hear someone saying, well, God loves everybody, or that Christ died for everybody, there's a deceitful witness, because that's not what the scriptures say. If Christ did indeed pay the debt for every single person in this world, then there's no more judgment. There's no condemnation for those for whom Christ paid the debt, such as the infinite accomplished work of the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation. You can have somebody preach on being justified by Christ, but putting it at faith and saying, well, it's when you believe that you're justified. No, faith is not the deliverer. Just as it says here in verse 25, a true witness delivers souls. How was a Christ Jesus a true witness? Not just in what he said, but what he did. You know, hear preachers today call out, if I got a witness, and they like to hear people say amen when what they've just said is just contrary to everything declared by Christ, the true witness. They're false witnesses. There's only one true witness. There's only one faithful witness that we find in Scripture. And here again, our refuge as children of God in our deliverance, the deliverance of our souls, whether it has to do with being delivered from the condemnation of the law, which Christ did in his death, or being delivered from the condemnation of our sin, being born in blindness and darkness and rebellion, and the Spirit now coming delivering. All the glory belongs unto him who is that faithful witness. Over in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, this is how John not even John boasted of being an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though he laid his head on our Savior's breast. That gave him no better position with his head there than anyone else that stood afar off and dared not even approach unto him. The difference is in who the Lord Jesus Christ is and his faithful witness. Here in Revelation chapter 1, here John is in... Verse 4, the, the Lord speaking with him there on the Isle of Patmos, and he's writing to the seven churches which are in Asia. These would have been congregations that the Lord raised up through the faithful preaching of the gospel. He said, grace be unto you and peace from him. So where is grace but from him? Where is peace but from him? We sing that song, praise God from whom all blessings flow. That's where grace and peace, it's not in our doing, our working, and our endeavoring. It's from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Seven is a type of perfection. But those spirits which are from his throne. And notice, and or even from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. Quit talking about yourself being a faithful witness. The other thing we have to testify is that I once was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. That's all we have. All the glory belongs unto him. He's the first begotten of the dead. First begotten in the sense that because of him, others do follow in his train. And he's the first begotten and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him. See, there's nothing about man in here. Unto him that loved us. So when you hear somebody say that, no, God loves everybody the same. What kind of love is it that God should love somebody and never send them the gospel? There's people dying in this world that have never heard this gospel of Christ, never heard and mentioned of his name. They die as they've lived. And you say, you say God loves them? No. I'll tell you, everyone that God loves, he delivers because he and his son is the faithful witness. He's true to his word even though we're not, washed us from our sins. The loving is in connection with the washing. Those that he has loved from eternity, he's always loved, and those that he has loved, he has washed. And made us to be kings and priests unto him and his father. Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. There again, what's the right interpretation of scripture? Anything that abases man and exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. So, there in Proverbs 14, 25. Isn't that a refuge? A certain refuge? <laughs> I don't want a refuge that's got a leak in it or has some back way where the enemy can get in. No, I need a perfect refuge, and that is in Christ.
Christ Jesus, who is the faithful witness. Anything other than him is nothing but deceitful lies. And then the last point here, verses 26 and 27. I put here a refuge in the fear of the Lord. There is peace in the fear of the Lord. Here it says, in the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. Now, when it says the fear of the Lord, the first thing I think of is in how the Lord Jesus Christ himself feared the Lord. He was heard, it says there in Hebrews chapter 5, in that he feared. That's why he was heard. And so in that fear, there is strong confidence. I have no confidence in myself, but the fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord that the Spirit gives brings that confidence, not in ourselves, but in that one who paid the debt. And that's why it's connected there in the second part of the verse with his children will have a place of refuge. It's God that has ordained that place of refuge in the fear of the Lord. If I have any fear of the Lord, it's in ever looking away from Christ and in any way putting confidence in myself or thinking myself to be somewhat rather than seeing that, no, my refuge and my confidence is in this one just as it says there in Psalm 46 and verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. It's all about who he is, manifest in his son, that work that he accomplished. And in that, the fear of the Lord, that reverence, that means that our eyes are ever on him who has done the work. And our heart, see, the fear of the Lord is confidence. There's no confidence looking in here. But looking to him who is that refuge. It's like they had those cities of refuge in the Old Testament to which any one that was found guilty could run. And so long as they stayed in that city of refuge, and there were six of them throughout the land of Israel, there was a high priest in each one. And so long as one remained in that Refuge, that's that place of refuge. They were delivered. The avenger of blood could not touch them. Well, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's that high priest. He shed his blood so that all of the curses of the righteous law or all the rages of men or even of our own conscience and soul and sin against us doesn't change one thing. That's what it is to have the fear of the Lord, the fear of ever leaving that refuge. And the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. Believing his word, our heart set upon him. And then verse 27 is connected to it as well. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Oh, to be at that fountain of life. And uh, that's the well springing up unto eternity. Christ, the water of life. And so that fear of the Lord always has been revealed in the heart. Proper fear of the Lord is rooted in that knowledge given by the spirit of who God is and who we are in relation to him, but only in, by, and through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says in verse 27 at the end, to depart from the snares of death. We say to somebody, run for your life. Well, where do we run? We run to him who is that refuge because apart from him, there's nothing but death. In him is that fountain of life. In him is that deliverance but depart from the snares of death. The snares of death are thinking that somehow we can work this out in ourselves. We can't. It's in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. But I feel like somebody that was on the back of a boat skiing, you're just skimming along on the water as the Lord's Spirit draws you to say some things, but there's a whole lot more here. As you look back and think, all we've done is just touch the surface. But I pray that in what we've heard, the Lord will indeed refresh our souls, strengthen us, not to look in here, not to look around us, but to Christ and Christ alone. All right.